Hey, Anne, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me and um, for us to have a conversation. Um, it's great for us to, to actually meet up and, and chat um, because I feel like there's, there's so much we can learn from one another, um, especially with, with the experience that you've had, you have of actually being on the NEC um, already. Um, and I, I, I kind of wanted to ask you, uh, uh, what, what has made you decide to, to, to run for the NEC um, again this time? Um, I think it, well, partly since I left the NEC, I really haven't known what was going on. So you get occasional stuff on Twitter and, and so on. But I don't know. I used to be in the meetings. I used to, for 18 years, I did long reports at every meeting. And I would put in what I thought, but I'd also put in what happened so people could make up their own minds. And um, uh, I've been missing that, except for Alice Terry's excellent report. So uh wasn't mm. doing much during lockdown. <laughs> and I thought, why not? Um, give it a go. And um, also, I think the party has been, it became very polarised mm. after 2016. And I think people now want, they want diversity, but they, they also want unity. Absolutely. I think that's, a, that's a such an important point as well, for them um, to talk about like diversity and, and unity. And I know that from the conversations that I've been having with a number of uh, members, people in our movement, supporters of the party, uh, they desperately need a Labour government, a radical Labour government. And I think that mm -hmm. when we think about some of the times at which we lost elections, party unity was one of the main reasons for why that is. So I think that for a number of members, a number of voters at the forefront of their minds, they're like, we need to unite as a movement. We talk about a broad church and we talk about our differences and we talk about the way, the different ways in which we think, but that surely that should be a thing of, that brings people together rather than something that divides people apart. Um, so it, it's, it's great once again to, to hear some of, some of your experiences of being on the NEC. And, and I want to ask you um, like, what are some of the things that you've done on the NEC and, and, and some of those, those surprises? But also, like, I also want to know, like, uh, those jaw-dropping moments in, in your years on the NEC where you're like, oh, well, my goodness. I suppose one thing looking back, I mean, I, uh, looking at your, your Twitter handle, it says you're a full-time troublemaker. Um, and when I was first <laughs> selected to the NEC, I was very much the full-time troublemaker. There was, me, Christine Shawcross, Mark Seddon, who edited Tribune, and Dennis Skinner, who's just a fantastic guy. And we were like the little gang of four in, in a very small minority. I love uh, that. But, uh, <laughs> but, but o over the years, actually, the party staff, I think, recognised that um, they weren't going to get anywhere by putting one little bit of the party into a box and saying they're a faction that doesn't have a any role to play that we're actually stronger if we all take part and I, I mm. think that's as true today as it was before. Um, Jaw-dropping moments, I suppose um, one of the ones that stands out goes back to the 2010 leadership election uh, when mm. um, we had four white men in their 40s on the ballot, Andy Burnham, Liz Kent, no Liz Kendall was later, Andy Burnham, Ed Balls, Ed Miliband, David Miliband, and Diane Abbott had some nominations, but not enough. And I mm. thought, this is not good enough. So I wrote, to, I was chair of the NEC that year. I wrote to Tony Lloyd, who was chair of the Parliamentary Labour Party, uh, and he said um, that if I wrote to him formally, saying that we needed uh, a, a range of candidates which was politically diverse and also ethnically and everything else, that that would be a stronger pool and whoever won would have a stronger mandate. Uh, Harriet Harman was very much up for it as well. So I wrote the letter, Tony Lloyd put it round the whole parliamentary Labour Party and I remember sitting in the General Secretary's office waiting for the stroke of noon when nominations closed. And we had a call which said Diane Abbott is on the ballot. 
and the last person to nominate her was David Miliband, <laughs> which is kind of bizarre because he was a candidate himself. And I yeah. just thought, this is great. And Diane didn't win, but the hustings all through that summer were so much more um, deep and broad and enjoyable uh, that I think it was worth it. And of course, um, that's what people did in 2015 for Jeremy as well. We'll broaden the debate. Yeah. And in 2015, it had a, yeah. <laughs> a very, a rather different outcome. So uh, maybe it paved the way. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I love the fact that, you know, diversity, representation, visible representation um, was at the forefront of people's minds then. Because I, I feel like that's another issue that's coming up. Um, how do we have an inclusive movement? How do we have a representative movement? And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm running for the NEC. And you know um, from the conversations um, that we, we've also had that there's never been a black man on the NEC in 120 years. So since its inception, there's never been a black man. But also we hear about parts of the party and, and groups of the party who constantly feel unwelcomed, marginalized, yes sidelined, ignored. And for me, when I hear about the stories of people leaving the party, but also how people are treated within our movement, it gives me the fuel and the reason and, and, and solidifies my reasoning for standing. Um, we need to remind people that this also can be a party for them, that we need to create a welcoming environment. Not only I'm talking about on, on, on social media, but I'm also talking about on CLPs, on the CLP level. I remember my first ever CLP meeting. I was yeah. 13 years old when, and I was shy. Was that? <laughs> How was it? Oh, oh, that is what, uh, maybe 12, 12, 13 years ago now. Wow. Uh, and I remember walking into Hackney North CLP. Uh, uh, you had uh, Greta, who, who was the secretary at the time. Uh, oh, I remember uh, Greta, yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, R.I.P. Greta, um, and she, she, she phenomenal um, activist. And I remember walking into that dusty hall, and she, point of order, chair, point of order, blah, 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 point of, and I was just like, "What the hell is going on? What is, what, what is this all about?" <laughs> and and it, I remember walking in with my tracksuit. I was in the tracksuit; it was raining, so I wore a hoodie. Came in my hoodie off, and everyone was like because they don't come across young black men who go turn up to CLP meetings. So it's almost like, uh, are, you, are you sure you're in the right place? Um, I'm like, hi, is this, is this the, the Labour Party meeting? They said, yeah, come in, come in. I said, okay, sat at the back and just observing what was going on. And, and then I left and I, I when I left, I said, I'm not returning to that meeting ever again uh, because they didn't feel welcoming at the time. So I think that for CLPs, we need to be able to um, make sure that we are welcoming but also on a larger scale that our party is inclusive. And, and what that looks like is, is, is having a, a place where if someone were to encounter something, they'll be able to complain and there's a procedure, a robust procedure, which is fit for purpose, that they can rely on, something that they can rely on, something that's independent, something that they can, they can really um, trust to handle their case. Because I think in the past, there has been a system in place that where, where, where members haven't trusted the complaints procedure and, and I feel like we need to have a proper robust procedure where people can trust. Um, some of the platforms that I'm, I'm standing on is, is democratization, accessibility, and, and all of that is encompassed in this idea of every single member, no matter who you are, what you believe in, what walk of life you come from, you're able to participate, you're able to shape our strategies, our policies and our campaigns. And that's what our movement should be all about. No matter who you are, you feel welcome, you have your voice heard, you're sat around the decision-making table. That's what we should be, that's the type of movement we should be creating, right? And that, that means having people that um, whoever walks in, they can see somebody who looks like them as a CLP officer, as a counsellor, uh, and, and indeed on the NEC so that they can say, oh, well, there's somebody I can talk to. And I mean, I'm conscious that I can maybe speak for women a bit or um, people on the left, or, uh, but I can't 
speak for, for young people, same people, LGBT people, what I can do is not tell, sit there and tell them how the party should run. It's making the party open and inclusive so that everyone can come in. And the, quite unusually, I'm on a secretary's group for, uh, on Facebook and um, somebody put in, they asked if uh, any CLP has an older members officer. Uh, as well as a youth officer <laughs> and mm -hmm. some people mailed back to say oh, hold on well all of us are old people's office <laughs> uh, it, so it's partly um, fame but it's also young members walking in and everyone in the room is old enough to be their grandfather and grandmother and so they're not going to come back either um, so yeah you're absolutely right, right. But I guess, I guess, just like what we're doing right now, uh, you're an older white woman, I'm a younger black man, and we're able to come into a space and create an environment where we can learn from one another. And I think that's, that's a great thing that we can potentially do on the NEC, that we can learn from one another, we can work together, and we can bring our lived experiences, but also the voices and the lived experiences of other people around. Um, and I feel like that, that's a type of environment that should be created in all of our CLPs around our movement, no matter who you are, what demographic or you belong to, you're able to meet with somebody else and, and able to have a constructive conversation with them. And, and, and that's the great, and that's the beauty about it all. Uh, and then again, that, that's the type of movement we should be, we should be creating. What well, I'll tell you, Sir Germain, if, you, if, you're, if you're elected, you must um, come to my CLP. Uh, I haven't been inviting any of the candidates, including myself, because until the election's over. But but you stood for the Bain seat earlier this year, didn't you? And you did very well among um, party members, individual members. Yeah. Uh, so th that was a, that was a journey. So earlier this year, I did stand for the NEC yeah. Bain rep, and uh, the way that election works is fifty percent trade unions and fifty percent members. Yeah. So my, that campaign was a real grassroots campaign. It was just me and a bunch yeah. of mates in a bar and a pub <laughs> strategy <laughs> meeting. This was obviously pre-COVID. Uh, and uh, we came up with all the ideas and campaign messages and things like that. And it, it was literally just picking up the phone uh, and, and calling different CLPs, calling comrades around the country saying, look, this is the platform that I'm standing on. This is the background that I come from. This is why I'm. This is what I'm passionate about. This is this is who I am, and that message really resonated with a lot of ethnic minorities. And I, although I came third in that election, I won the most membership votes. Now, the reason why I came third was because obviously it's fifty percent trade union, and uh, I only had my my cute, but I love them musicians union. Uh, yeah, they yeah, supported yeah. me tooth and nail. Yeah. Um, and obviously you had other candidates who had um, blocks of unions. But nonetheless, that was, that, for some reason, I, I saw that as a mandate though, to still represent members across our country. And when I saw the opportunity to, to go for the NEC again, a number of comrades and friends and colleagues from across the party, because I do a lot of activism inside and outside of the party. So I had members from all across the party message me, Jermaine, look, you've got the most amount of members votes in the NEC Bain rep. We believe you should run again. And I had to think about it and I thought about, and at the time, you know, you had the death of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter protests. Um, and I said, you know what, now is the time that we have voices around that table. And I heard a quote two weeks ago and it stuck with me and I'm going to use it from now on. Yes. We might not be able to have every single person around the table, but we need to make sure that every single voice is on the menu. So how do we ensure we go to that table for the NEC armed with a menu full of lived experiences and voices of members around the country and say we need to deal with this we need to deal with transphobia we need to deal with sexual harassment we need to deal with racism we need to all forms of racism we need to create a movement that is inclusive democratized accessible for everyone for all and i'm so pumped up and fired up and full of energy uh, <laughs> that i i really want to i really want to be able to to, to 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 do this on the nec uh, so, so yeah, absolutely, um, and and that's the background of, of the NEC NEC Bain rep, and that's also why I created the 1987 caucus, yeah. which is just a space for 
young black men in our movement to share ideas, to drop in um, job, um, job applications and, and, and job posts uh, and support one another within our movement, um, encourage them and empower them to go for different roles. Um, and, it's, and it's still flourishing to this day. So I'm so proud of those young Fantastic. men. Yeah. Um, in that group. I, I wanna ask you, uh, based on all the decisions that you've made in the past on the NEC, what lessons will you what lessons will you take forward um when you are because i like saying when not if <laughs> when you are el elected onto, <laughs> onto the nec we've got to put that energy out there on the whens um but yeah when when you're on uh, on the nec what what lessons will you bring forward from from what you've learned in the past um okay just at a very basic level Get to the meeting an hour beforehand and make sure you read all the papers, all, all the papers that are coming to the meeting. Because that's something that um, it seems to be oh. happening more. Uh, we used to get papers in advance for a while, but and it's a very practical thing because sometimes if you arrive on the day, two minutes before the start of the meeting, there'll be like 50 pages of papers and things will be in them that you uh, need to check out. So that's a very practical thing. On a higher level, I would say, listen to what everyone else has to say. What happened over the last two, last two years I was on the NEC, the meetings got longer and longer, people spoke for longer and longer, and fewer and fewer minds were changed. So a lot of them, you could have had the vote before anyone had spoken, and it would have been exactly the same um, mm. five hours later after you know, everyone was kind of dying for a cup of tea or getting off going home and so on. So I just think listening and respecting other people, that's something that needs to be done collectively. Uh, I was always, well, I was classified as a, you know, a hard left troublemaker uh, for my first few years. And then I seem to have kind of morphed into some sort of Blairite fellow traveller. But I haven't changed any of my principles. I've always voted against austerity, against privatisation, for public services, um, for decent pensions and benefits. And um, there was actually very little policy difference between myself and uh, what was the grassroots alliance in 2018. Uh, it wasn't policy, it was, um, yeah, well, things split in various ways. And the lesson is that when we're split, we lose. Yeah. So I think everybody, wherever they're coming from, will have taken that on board. And maybe we can make a new start, less talking, more listening. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess one of one of my final questions to you is, is well, I got two final questions. One which is more selfish, and, and one which is more about the, <laughs> the rural movement. Uh, but I guess what, as a young person running in this race, um, I'm learning so much. I'm experiencing so much, and I, and I I don't want to be honest with with a lot of people. I don't know everything, but what I do have is is passion is experience, lived experience, and I have the voices of so many people mm -hmm. who have come to me and said what they're going through, where they see the movement going. And it's, for me, it's how do I bring that to the forefront, right? But what advice could you give to me as a young person running this campaign, uh, bearing in mind some of the things that you've experienced um, from all different parts of our party and from those five hour debates and discussions and arguments in NECs, in, in those NEC meetings, what, would you what kind of advice would you give to me as a, as a young person with loads of energy who says and i'm saying i want to bring a fresh left voice to the nec what advice would you give to me uh well in terms of the success of the campaign i actually lost in 2018. Mm -hmm. i was 10th on nominations but 13th in the ballot so on, on winning uh, an omar ballot i'm not at all complacent uh but lessons um, I think be yourself, don't be pigeonholed, uh, just um, say what you think honestly 
uh, and people will respect that and listen to it. Uh, you're not in, you have a lot of supporters, you have a lot of friends, uh, and that's great, but you're not, um, I mean, open labour is um, fantastic in that way because it brings together people who've got all sorts of uh, different political perspectives. But like you said at the last meeting we were in together, uh, we learned to disagree agreeably. Mm. So that's the thing I'd say. And just keep going because uh, if things don't turn around soon, it will be your generation that elects yeah. the next. Labour government. I'm not at all complacent about winning a general election in 2024. I'll put it no stronger than that. But mm. we, we will still need the party. We will still need passion, people with passion and conviction. So yeah. you'll be around for a long time to come. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And, and you're right to touch on, uh, on the future. And I want to end with that question. Yeah. I guess it could be a question for both of us, but yeah. okay. for you, what do you see the future of our movement being? Um, we, we have to be an alternative, and it's very difficult during the COVID crisis because it's difficult to vote against lockdown and restrictions and so on. But I would like to see Labour putting some print, clear principles out there, for instance, £20 a week extra on universal credit and benefits. That should stay for the foreseeable. It should be a permanent increase. People should not be evicted from private homes. That may come to an end. That should continue. So there are some things where there are very clear principles where we can say this is what a Labour government could do. Uh, my MP is the fantastic Annalise Dobb, so uh, Shadow Chancellor, uh, and she's doing what she can. But when we had, when Jeremy Corbyn was leader, so before lockdown and everything, we used to have monthly campaign days. There'd be a national campaign day, there'd be a theme, it would be health, it would be rail fares, and everybody in the country would be campaigning on the same thing, going out there, knocking on doors, which we can't do, tweeting, uh, posting on social media, uh, and it would be good to get back to that again, to bring people together. We are beginning to campaign again. We've got important elections coming up. Yeah. Members need positive messages that they can, can, can campaign on, and that's something I would raised immediately on the NEC because it, people can go because they feel they're not welcome but also if the, they feel there's nothing to inspire them and say yeah I, wow I want to campaign on that I want to go out and tweet and post and leaflet and everything so yeah I'm not sure if that answers your question I'll ask you then um, what what what, what would you raise at your first NEC meeting? And well, every, everybody, everybody can get to ask the leader a question. Okay, so. That, that's a really important, I, you know what? I, I actually haven't thought about that. What would be the first thing I raise? Uh, but the first thing that comes into my heart right now is what I have seen over the last couple of uh, weeks, in, in particular on social media. And that's the level of transphobia. Yeah. And I think that will be the, the first thing that I bring up um, in, 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 our, in our NEC meeting is how do we really tackle and have a zero tolerance to transphobia in our movement? What are, what's the action plan for that? And how do we measure success? What are, what are some of the, 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 what's the, the disciplinary process for that? because we've seen a number of individuals um, say some really hurtful things um, about our trans siblings and the trans community, um, and with no remorse, um, and there's no, no action was taken. So I think that would be one of the first things I, I'll bring up. But also, I've spoken with um, Labour um, GRT, the Gypsy Roma Traveller yeah. community. I've spoken with the, the Labour Homelessness Campaign. I've spoken with the Labour Drug Reform 
campaign and, and they're, all, they're all putting forward amazing policies and, and I really want them to be at the forefront working with leadership, working with the NEC to start to shape some policies for our movement. Because if we think about what are our principles as a movement, our socialist values are having anti-racism at its core, those need to remain as the pillars moving forward. And how do we bring in all these amazing groups that are doing amazing thinking and, and, and thought leadership and, and coming up with amazing ideas? How do we, we bring them in-house to come around the table and say, look, now it's time that we put forward, as you said, that alternative. This is, this is the alternative. This is a way of creating a better country for everyone. And, you know, I really, I, I think about the hope that was, injected into our country over the last couple of years um, with Jeremy Corbyn as leader. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people um, very much debate about him as a leader, but from what I saw on the ground, from the circles that I was speaking in at, at the time, they felt very hopeful because we put forward an alternative and people were thinking, wow, actually this is, a, this is a, the type of society we should be living in and we should be working towards. And I guess my role on the NEC would be to uh, while holding leadership to account and ensuring that they're transparent, supporting leadership and reminding them of that same hope and how do we build on that? How do we continue the momentum and move forward to a, a better society where everyone can reach their full potential, where everyone um, doesn't have to worry about when they're gonna, when the, if, the, if they miss the next paycheck, they're gonna have to be kicked out of their house, where everyone can live in a safe, secure environment uh, and where people don't have to be stabbed or killed just because of the area that they come from. And, and, and I feel like that's the background that I come from. Um, I've, the most recent friend that I lost was in January, he was stabbed. And I, I feel like when we fight as a movement, by the, by the way, I've never seen a set of people argue and fight more <laughs> with one another and let the police <laughs> get away with literally murder. Um, but when we fight, and we lose elections, the only people who are actually missing out are the people who really need a radical Labour government. Absolutely. I'm talking about the single mums in Sunderland, I'm talking about uh, the dads working 24-7 in Manchester and in Leeds and in, in other parts of Yorkshire and, and those young people have, who have them to pay £9,250 in tuition fees in Northampton and Coventry and the young people who are losing their lives to serious youth violence in London they're the people who desperately need a Labour government and we are doing them a disservice when we fight one another and not work with one another to, uh, to, to, to create a proper movement and work towards a radical Labour government. And I think that, and you and I may not agree on everything, but we are able to work with one another in order to, to make that happen. And I feel like if we do spread that message to more people yeah. in our movement and say, yes, we might have differences, but those should be things that bring us together, not separate us. Let's bring it together. That's the type of space and the type of movement that we should be trying to create. And I know you agree with me on that. Yeah, I agree with you on all of that. And 